He even says, and I'll cro close with this, he even says in a verse in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 255, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayu qayyum la ta'khuduhu sanatun wa la naum lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard man da la diyashfu indahu illa bi idni yalamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khafum wa la yuhitun bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bi mashah wasi'a kursiyuhu samawati wa al-ard wa la ya'uduhu hiftuhuma wa hula li yuladim he tells us in the last and the final testament, who he is and who he's not. It said Allah. He is the one beside whom there's no other God. No gods beside God. He's the ever living and self subsisting. I Meaning he always was. He's the eternal, the beginning, the end, and everything in between. He's the eternal. And he doesn't need anybody to take care of him. Because he takes care of everybody. Then it tells us that he doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't, you know, like, oh man, I'm wiped out. Creating all that stuff, I've got to take a day off. We don't have that. That's not. It says he created the heavens and the earth in six days. But on the, on the seventh day he rested, it's not in here. It just, uh, it doesn't even mention the seventh day, actually. It just says, and then, and then he went over his throne. That's what it says. To him belongs the heavens and the earth and everything in between. Then look at this rhetorical question. Who is there that could come between God and his creation? Except that God would have to give him permission to do it to start with. Oops. Whoops. And if Jesus said, I have to do everything by God's permission, then what does that mean? Made me think. Then it goes on. It says that his knowledge encompasses everything. Front, back, up, down, all around. And you don't have any knowledge except he gave it to you. Then it tells us, that his cursey extends over the universe. And about that, the prophet, peace be upon him, told us that that cursey is in front of his arsh. This is in front of his throne, and it's like a ring, if you took a ring and threw it in the desert by comparison of size. It shows you how small we really are, doesn't it? And he never gets weary or tired of taking care of it. And he is mighty above all the majestic. This is called Ayatul Kursi. It's in chapter 2, verse 255. It's really a really beautiful verse. And really help you to think about it. But following that, it's the one I want to put the emphasis on. This important verse. La ikraha fadin. It means there is no compulsion in the way of Islam. Because God has already made it clear to you who he is, what he is, what he's not. And if you want to follow it, up to you. If you don't want to, up to you. Nobody can force anybody into Islam. The word Islam, that's usually a question I get. What does Islam mean? Does it mean peace? I don't want to take exception to what Imam Abdul Malik said. He said it means peace. I actually usually tell people it doesn't really mean peace. There's peace in it, but it's not the peace that you think. The word Islam, according to my studies, you might correct me, it means more about submission and surrender and obedience and sincerity. And when I found that word sincerity, I went, whoa, whoa, full stop. If I have to be sincere to be a Muslim, Nobody could be forced to be a Muslim. La ikraha fadin. So how could you spread Islam by force? You couldn't. If that's true, if the word Islam means you've got to be sincere, can you force somebody to be sincere? <laughs> Go talk to anybody who's been through divorce court. 
<laughs> Go ahead. You know what I'm talking about. You can't force anybody to be sincere. Some people can't even force them to live up to their word. So if it means I have to be sincere with God, and I have to surrender to Him, submit to Him, obey Him, wow, that's pretty serious stuff. Oh, and now comes the word peace. And I have to be in peace with God after I did all the other stuff, even if He gives me what I didn't want. Ugh. You know? Like, okay, I surrendered to God, I obeyed Him, I'm submitting my will to Him, I'm, I'm being sincere with Him, and I still didn't win the lottery. Hmm? Now what? He maybe even found out one of my dear relatives had cancer, and I didn't want that. Maybe I wind up with something, and I don't want that. But I'm still going to be in peace with my Creator, because that's what it means. By the way, what's a Muslim? It's Arabic for the one who does Islam. Because in Arabic you use a prefix, mu, instead of the suffix, er. You know what I'm saying? Walk, er. Talk, er. Think, er. Stink, er. Hmm? Well, you know how it works. But in Arabic you put mu in front of the verb, mu. So if somebody's talking, I told you the word, kalam, mutakalam, the one who speaks. Wow. And what about traveling? When we travel, Arabic is suffer. Our word safari is coming from Arabic. Word safari, it comes from Arabic. It means to travel. Musafar. And by the way, sometimes when I travel, I suffer, but I don't think that's the same thing. There's something called the Adhan. You know when they call the people to the prayer, they go, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. By the way, don't do that in an airplane. <laughs> or even the airport. That's even worse. <laughs> but the one who's doing that, he's, he's doing what's Adhan. Adhan. That's what that's called. He's called the Mu'adhan. Mu'adhan. And you see Muslims, they stand like this, you know, and they line up. And it'd be like this, and they bow and all that. Well, he's doing that. That's called sully. Sully. Go, okay, now tell me how to say it. Is it a sullier? No. How would I say it? Sully. You got it. Like a native Arab. <laughs> so if somebody does Islam, what are they? A what? I can't hear you. What is it? Somebody does Islam as a... Real loud? Muslim. You want to be a what? Muslim. Say a shadow with light, light. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Hold it. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> no, I love to be with people. I do. But always people ask me, do you travel? I've been around the world, yeah, several times. Where's your favorite place? And I tell them New York City. Although I never really actually lived there. I've been there and stayed there for weeks at a time. They say, why of all places? I mean, you know, I lived in Texas, lived in the mountains, I lived yeah, out in the ocean, I lived in so many places. Why in New York City? I said, this is where the people are. I'm a people person. So if you have a different opinion than I do, I'm glad. Because it gives us something to talk about. And I like the things that Imam Malik, Abdul Malik was saying when he opened up the program. And I do think that it is important for us to open up our hearts, too, and open up our minds. And by the way, just for the heck of it, as I'm closing off here, I'd like to share with you something that I read in the battle on the way over here, if you don't mind. This is the freebie that I got out of the hotel. I think I read it in chapter 7 in the book of Matthew. Yeah. Here we go. It's easy to remember 7-7 seven, seven because it's Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks will receive and he that seeks will find. And to him that knocks it will be opened. 
I was reading the Quran one time and putting my Bible side by side and suddenly it came over me and I got, you know, you get the chills when you see something, it make you cry. I always wondered about those, those words when I was a kid. I can understand, you know, ask, because kids, we're asking mom all the time, you know, like especially, you know what the most famous one is, right? Are we there yet? <laughs> asking, asking, yeah? And about receiving, even the Bible makes it clear, if a child asks the parent for a loaf of bread, he's not going to give him a rock, is he? And if he asks for something, to a fish, he's not going to give him a snake. So that's easy to figure out. But the one thing that puzzled me was the knock. Why knock? What has that got to do with anything? It wasn't until I came to this now and I realized there was something else I needed to do. I need to open up something, that's for sure. But what's this knocking and opening? What is that? And it was after I had that discussion with my friend, the Muslim, about proving there's God. And I started talking 90 miles an hour to him all night long. I was just check, 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 check. <laughs> Finally, he told me, you know, your problem isn't between you and me. Your problem's not between you and your dad or between you and your wife. Because these were the things I was discussing. What will happen if I became a Muslim? He said, your problem's between you and him. You need to go talk to him. And he walked off and let me stand in there. So I did. I went out behind my dad's place. Figured hey, nobody can see me here except him. And I said, yeah, okay, those Muslims, they kind of look toward the east or somewhere. Let me do that. I put my head down on the ground and I said, okay, God, if you're there, guide me. That's why I named the station this, by the way. Because that was the only thing I could think to say. By the way, I'm not too bad on coming up with words. Maybe you figured that out. But on that prayer, I could only say those words. Guide me. Guide me. When I raised up my head, I understood. The problem was not on the outside. It was on the inside. And I needed to open up this and this. Because until you open the mind and open the heart, what do you got? So I realized that, but then it was a few months later when I was looking at the Quran and I asked them, what's that first chapter mean? Fatiha. What does that mean? Fatiha. That's fat. Fat tiha. What does it mean? And they said, no, that means open. It's the opening. May Allah open all of our hearts and our minds to the truth. Amen. It's nice to be with all of you.